When we think about Darwin, we often associate him with the idea of natural selection. That is, there's differential uh, survival among individuals, um, and this is the idea of fitness. But there's another component of fitness that often doesn't, um, we don't think about quite so um, vividly. But this is an idea that Darwin put forth as well, and that's the idea of sexual selection. The idea that um, reproduction is really the key to fitness because it doesn't matter if you survive unless you survive to reproduce. And there are lots of great examples of sexually selected um, traits. So you can think of male weaponry, like the horns of moose, for example. But there are also um, these uh, amazing displays that males do, whether it's a morphological trait like a peacock's tail or um, even more subtle traits like a sword on a sword tail fish, the length of which can be more, the longer it is, the more attractive it is to females. And Darwin uh, thought a lot about these sexually selected traits because initially they were really confusing to him because things like the antlers of moose would in fact not improve your ability to survive, right? In fact, they could probably hinder that because they're so costly both to build and to carry around. Uh, and it wasn't until he came up with this idea of sexual selection that they were used in battle for access to females to improve reproduction um, that everything became very clear. But what Darwin didn't think about, and probably in part because he grew up as a Victorian Brit, uh, that this sexual selection can occur long after mating. And this is because um, in most species, a female will mate with multiple males. And therefore, within a female reproductive tract, there can be, for example, sperm from multiple males directly competing in literally the race to the egg. And there are an equal number of amazing reproductive traits that have evolved because of this post-mating sexual selection. And one of this is what we've been studying in our group. In particular, we've been studying two species of wild mice in the genus Paramiscus, uh, commonly referred to as deer mice. And the reason we've been studying these two species is because they differ in their mating systems. So one species is a classic mammal, that is males will mate with essentially whoever they run into, and females will therefore experience high levels of sexual selection uh, because she can have, in fact, um, sperm from multiple males uh, within her reproductive tract at one time. So males will um, mate with females in rapid succession. By contrast, a rare exception uh, in the, in, among mammals is Paramiscus polyonotus, and this species is both socially and genetically monogamous. That is, males and females, at least for the course of a reproductive system, uh, a season, uh, are in fact uh, 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 remain together, and there's no cheating that goes on. And so in this system, there's very low levels of sperm competition. And in fact, you can look at the sperm from these two species and see that one in the promiscuous species, uh, the sperm are incredibly fast, as you may predict. Whereas in the monogamous species, the sperm are slow, meander along. They do the job, but they're in no hurry to get to the, um, the end goal, the egg because there's no competition. So my postdoc, Heidi Fisher, made this incredible discovery in these two species as she was starting to um, try to understand um, how sperm competition affects sperm morphology and behavior in these mice. And she spent hours looking through the microscope at these sperm and noticed this interesting phenomenon that as she um, collected sperm from males, she'd put them on um, a microscope slide and within a few minutes, the sperm would clump together. And this would happen in both species. And what was especially interesting is that these clumps swim faster than individual sperm. And this sort of makes sense in that um, they can together have more thrust they also tend to swim in a more linear path um, and outcompete single sperm. So this is this really interesting case in which you have sperm cooperation. Sperm will actually clump together and outrace single non-cooperating sperm. But if you think back to what I said a minute ago, and that is this probably evolved under sexual selection because you had sperm from multiple males in a female reproductive tract, this raises this sort of problem in that you want to clump, but you don't want to clump with sperm from the other male because you want to help sperm from your male, but not the other guy's sperm. So Heidi raised the question then, um, 
can they discriminate? Can they preferentially clump with sperm from one male to the exclusion of the other? So to answer this question, she did a really um, clever experiment. So what you can do is you can take sperm and using a very simple dye, dye them different color. So she collected sperm from two different males, initially from two different species, then repeated this with um, two males that were unrelated, and then even two brother males. And what you can do is dye these sperm, mix them together, let them form clumps, and then take the clumps and count how many, let's say, green versus red sperm you have in a clump. And you would expect, on average, that they would be 50-50 red and green, and any deviations for that would suggest that they could preferentially clump with sperm from the same male. And what she found remarkably is that when you take two sperm from two different species, they'll clump, but they discriminate. So there were more green sperm together and more red sperm together than you would expect based on chance. And in fact, the same level of discrimination was seen within a species between two unrelated males and even among brothers, suggesting that there's some sort of mechanism that can discriminate sort of self-sperm from other sperm. Now, one of the next steps, of course, is to understand what this mechanism is, and we don't know that yet. But here's what's even more remarkable, is that we can compare this to the monogamous species. Now, I told you already the monogamous species form these clumps. And you would maybe wonder why do they clump if in fact they're monogamous. Like I told you, there's no need to clump, right? Um, but in fact, um, historically, this group of mice is all largely promiscuous. And we think monogamy is the uh, derived or new, new state. So this clumping could be a holdover from their evolutionary past. But what's interesting is when we look at discrimination, in this monogamous species. In fact, we don't see any discrimination. They clump 50-50. And so what that suggests, in fact, is that this um, ability to cooperate and, in fact, discriminate probably arose because of sexual selection. And as I mentioned, the big goal now is to understand how this may have evolved uh, in terms of the underlying molecular mechanism. What is it about these sperm that allow them to um, clump, one, to clump together? So are there, for example, sticky proteins on the surface of the sperm heads? And is that mechanism the same, or is there another mechanism that then allows them to discriminate even sperm from a brother? And I think this remains one of the great uh, challenges in our group, is to understand um, the molecular mechanism of sperm cooperation and discrimination. So one question is, why do they cooperate? And I think there's two. On one hand, you may think, well, why, co why cooperate at all? Because um, only one sperm is going to be able to inseminate that egg. So if 20 of you in a big clump, in this case, the, the uh, optimal clump size is about eight. Uh, that is, if you have fewer, you're slower. And if you have more, you're slower, because the sperm start to swim against each other as you get too many in a clump. So if you have a, a, eight of you together, and you're the fastest clump size, and you get to the egg first, only one of you gets to win. We have no idea how that decision gets made of who um, gets to inseminate the egg. right? So I think there's a lot to explore there. But it's clear that if you're part of that group of eight, compared to you being a lone sperm on your own, you have almost 0% chance of getting to the egg first, because all those clumps are going to beat you. So if you're one of eight, your chances are one in eight, as opposed to um, none, essentially, if you're on your own. So this form of sperm cooperation has been observed in other species of rodents and um, other species of mammals, this idea of cl uh, clumping. Although this is the first time that anybody's described this ability to discriminate. Um, but of course, what everybody wonders is, uh, what about human sperm? Uh, human sperm, along with a, a whole bunch of other mammals, don't seem to have the ability um, to clump. And this may be in part because of the sperm morphology. So what's unique about many of the um, species that show sperm cooperation is they have sperm um, that have this unique morphology. They have the sperm head, and they have this midpiece in the tail, which is typical, but they have a hook on it. And it could be that that hook, we don't know this for sure, may increase the surface area of the head, making it more likely to be sticky, maybe even making it more likely to have this ability to discriminate. Um, male sperm from humans don't have, they have um, almost elliptical heads and no hook. That may or may not be important, but there's a correlation between the presence or absence of the hook and the ability to um, clump.
So the big challenges uh, to this research are to understand how this works at a molecular level. And one of the exciting things is that if we can understand how these cells communicate, I think it's going to have ramifications not just for understanding sperm clumping in this particular species, but could have potential larger ramifications, for example, in understanding more generally how cells communicate to each other. And in fact, this may be akin to uh, a self-non-self -self recognition system that people have been studying, uh, cellular biologists have been studying for years, and this could shed new light on to this. Of course, once we find the molecular mechanisms in this species, we all want to query um, a number of other species that also show this clumping behavior and ask, are the same molecular mechanisms involved? Or is this something that has evolved independently and repeatedly through different molecular mechanisms? But that's still up in the air. <laughs>